Nephropathy Index looks at individual amino acids and tells you how likely that amino acid is to be found in near water versus like away from water. The hydropathy plot takes that individual um, hydropathy index for those individual amino acids, takes a sliding average of them and plots them along the length of a protein. And this is going to allow you to identify regions that are probably transmembrane regions. So they're going through a membrane or for water soluble proteins, regions that are probably on the outside of the protein versus the inside. It can get kind of confusing because for a hydropathy index, if you have a positive value, that's going to be hydrophobic. And if you have a negative value, that's going to be hydrophilic. And so why is this and how do we interpret these plots and how can we make our own? Let's go look. Scientists, we like putting numbers on things. And one of the things that we want to put a number on is hydropathy or how much a molecule is avoided by water. If something is hydrophobic, water avoids it. And if something is hydrophilic, water likes to hang out with it. And we want to put a number to the hydropathy of various molecules, such as amino acids, the individual building blocks of proteins. So we use this thing called the hydropathy index. We'll talk much more about this in a minute, but basically it's going to be a measure of hydropathy. The more hydrophobic something is, so the more water avoids it, the bigger the positive number. If you see something with a positive hydrophobicity index, this is likely an, um, going to be found, say, in a membrane or in the inside of water-soluble proteins. On the other hand, if something is hydrophilic, it's going to have a negative hydropathy index, and it's likely going to be found in contact with water, such as on the surface of water-soluble pro water -soluble proteins um, and that sort of thing. We often call these like solvent-exposed regions. But here I've got ahead of myself because I'm talking about regions. Because when amino acids link to, although we can give a hydropathy index to individual amino acids, these individual amino acids are going to link together to form a protein. And it's in the context of that protein that we have to consider whether regions of a protein are hydrophilic or hydrophobic. It's not enough to just have one hydrophobic amino acid to have, say, a membrane protein. So if we want to be able to predict what proteins are likely membrane proteins, and even what regions of a protein are likely embedded in a membrane, we need to be able to look at a bigger scale than just the individual amino acids. And this is where hydropathy plots come in. Here we graph the hydropathy index over a protein's length. And this is going to allow us to help predict those sort of things. Rather than just plotting each individual hydropathy index over the course of the protein for each individual amino acid, as we'll see, that will give us a really noisy plot. So we want to kind of average out some of the features, and so we use a sliding window going across the length of the protein. And we'll get much more into all of this, both the theory as well as I will take you through how you can check out and make hydropathy plots for various proteins and then interpret them. But first, let's start by, by addressing this whole negative positive thing for the hydropathy index, because I always found that really confusing. So basically, this hydropathy index, as we discussed, is going to be a measure of how hydrophilic, so water loved, or hydrophobic, water avoided a molecule is. And you can do a hydropathy index for various types of molecules, but today we're going to be talking mainly in the context of individual amino acids. Now. The reason we have this whole negative positive thing is because, well, what the hydropathy index actually represents is a change in Gibbs free energy. When you move a molecule from a lipidy, greasy environment to a watery, aqueous one. Basically, the Gibbs free energy, much more on this in other posts, the molecules that are high, have a high energy, are going to be kind of unstable and reactive whereas molecules that have a low free energy are going to be um, less reactive, they're gonna be more stable, they're gonna be happier. And I like to think of low energy molecules as kind of being more comfy and high energy molecules being less comfy and if they can kind of make themselves comfy, com comfy, they will want to. If we take a molecule that's uncomfy, it's in a high free energy state, and we move it to an environment where it's more comfy, it's more happy, it's going to be in a lower energy free energy state. And if we take the delta G, 
So we subtract the old energy from the new energy, we're gonna get a negative number. And so if the number is negative, this is going to be favorable. And so if we're moving a molecule from a greasy environment to a watery one, and it likes the watery environment better, it's going to have a negative delta G. It's therefore going to be what we call hydrophilic. So the, and the more negative this is, the happier the molecule would be, the larger the negative number is going to be. Now, what if we go the opposite direction? What if we take a molecule and we take it, we're still taking it from that hydrophobic, from that, um, that greasy lipidy environment and we're moving it to a watery one. Now here though, if the molecule likes being in that lipidy environment more, now we're kind of, it's like we're pushing a ball uphill. We're making it to a state where it's more uncomfy. We're therefore going to have a positive delta G and we say that this molecule is hydrophobic. Now, the more it hates that watery environment and the more it loves its, the greasy environment, the bigger this delta G is gonna be, the positive delta G, remember. And so the matter it's gonna be at you if you were to move it, the more, the more hydrophobic we say it is and the larger that positive number. But remember, here we're looking at the scale of these individual amino acids and really, when we're talking about a protein, we need to consider that all these amino acids are linking up together, and it's the combination of these amino acids that's going to influence the structure of a protein. In fact, the hydropathy of those individual amino acids is going to greatly influence how the protein folds, because the protein is going to fold up in a way that is going to maximize the interactions of those hydrophilic parts with the water, and minimize the exposure of those hydrophobic parts to the water. And so if we're talking about your typical water-soluble protein, so something you'll find inside of a cell or on the outs outside of a cell, um, these are going to have those hydrophilic parts on the outside. We call these often like solvent exposed or surface residues. We talk about residue basically when amino acids link together. They lose their amino parts and their carboxylic acid parts because when they form these peptide bonds, they use those parts to link together. And therefore, we can't, we can't call them amino acids anymore. Instead, we call them residues, the residuals, the leftovers from when they made those bonds. Um, and so basically, when we have these residues on the outside, um, are going to be the hydrophilic ones, and on the inside, they're going to be the hydrophobic ones. And we're going to look and see how with the hydropathy plot, we can actually see regions of a, predict regions of a protein that are likely to be on the surface versus in the interior. But what about membrane proteins? We're going to look at this too, because in a membrane protein, well, now we have something that's part, at least part of it is going to be in a lipidy environment. And so not the whole protein, because parts of it are going to be on the watery environment, but you're also going to have parts that are in that lipidy environment. And these lipidy, the parts inside the membrane, these kind of like transmembrane or these membrane domains, they're going to have to be kind of like inside out. They're going to have to have regions where their hydrophobic parts on the outside and their hydrophilic parts are going to be hidden inside. And we'll look and see how hydropathy plots can help us see this as well. For a hydropathy plot, we're going to be looking over the length of a protein. So we're going to be going, say, from the end terminus, kind of like the starting end, to the C terminus, the ending end of the protein. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a sliding scale, a sliding window. So we're going to be taking the average of amino acids in a window and kind of just like going over the course of a protein. This is going to kind of balance out some of the noise. If you were to just plot the amino acids, individual hydropathy index for the amino acids without taking any sort of windowing into account, any sort of averaging, you get something that would be really, really noisy. Because although we talk about the hydrophilic stuff being solvent exposed and the hydrophobic stuff being um, like hidden in the center, it's not quite that simple. And even if you have a region that's mostly on the outside, say you had an alpha helix, so one of those um, kind of like, structures. 
Well, part of this might be on the solvent exposed, but part of it is going to be on the inside protected more. And so these parts are going to be interspersed with these amino acids, even though they're right next to each other, they have different properties. And therefore, if you were to plot the data, you would get something really, really noisy. Um, and so we'll look more at some examples of this later. But if you have a small window size, even with a small window size, as opposed to just like no, no windowing at all, you still get really, really noisy data. So if we want to figure out, be able to better predict things, we need to take averages where we're kind of evening out some of that noise. If we want to predict a transmembrane segment, so a part that actually goes through the membrane, we're gonna wanna take a big window, about 19 to 21 amino acids. For, and this is because that's about the length of one of these, alpha, the amount, number of amino acids for an alpha helix to pass through the, trend, the membrane. And these alpha helices are one of the key ways in which these membrane proteins pass through. And so we'll see that if we take a window of about that size, we can then actually predict transmembrane segments of proteins that are going to be represented by these broad stretches where you have a positive hydropathy index. And remember, the positive hydropathy index is telling us that something is hydrophobic. And we're going to want to have hydrophobic amino acids in that transmembrane segment. And then you're likely also going to see some hydrophilic segments um, that are kind of bridging the, bridging the helices, bridging the transmembrane segments. But what if you were to look at water-soluble proteins? Well, here you're likely not going to have any of those large, broad peaks. You're not going to have any of those stretches where you have a lot, a lot, a lot of hydrophobic stuff. Instead, you're more likely to have smaller segments that are going to be hydrophobic. Um, and so because we're looking for smaller features, we're going to be using a smaller window size. So typically this is done with like five to seven amino acids in our sliding window. And this is going to allow us to predict the surface regions of water-soluble proteins, as well as regions that are more interior. And so we're going to look at examples of how we can actually go in with software and make graphs, plots like this for various proteins and analyze them. So how what these programs often use is this like kite doolittle scale or this kite doolittle method. And this goes back to this Journal of Molecular Biology paper by Jack Kite and Russell Doolittle in, from 1982. And this paper, a simple method for displaying the hydropathic, hydropathic character of a protein. What did they do? Basically, they did what we were just talking about, but they were they established this way for doing it. They took experimental data from different sources of the hydropathy index for individual amino acids, and then they designed this program that uses a moving segment approach, so that's our sliding window, that continuously determines the average hydropathy within a segment. Um, and they're plotted from the amino to the carboxy terminus. So that's what we talked about before. They're going to have a midpoint line that corresponds to the average of hydropathy of the amino acid compositions found in most sequence proteins. And then they talk about how there's this nice correspondence between the interior proteins and the um, being hydrophobic so on the hydrophobic side of that line and the exterior proteins on portions on the hydrophilic signs and things like this. So basically, this paper, like this in their abstract, they kind of just summarize it all up really nicely of all that we were talking about. And so I encourage you to check out this paper. They use in the paper, they um, show some examples. And this is going, this is one example, bovine chemotrypsin. We'll look more in, in Uniprot and PD, the PDB in a second as to how we can actually go and make our own um, plots and interpret these. But in the paper, what they're doing in this figure is they're showing you the effect of the window size. So this is going to be one of those water-soluble proteins. So we're not expecting to see any big, broad transmembrane domains. And if we look at a small window size, so five, say, we get some pretty noisy data. If we look at a window of nine, well, here we're able to better kind of say, OK, we're going to even out some of that noise. And now what can we see? Well, now we can see that there do seem to be some distinct features that are going to be more hydrophobic and some that are going to be more hydrophilic. 
And these hydrophobic ones, what these lines are showing us is that these are regions that are actually from the crystal structure. So from scientists solving the structure of the protein, figuring out what it actually looks like at the molecular level, they were able to see that these regions are actually on the inside of proteins and that these regions were actually on the outside of proteins. So this is kind of like our experimental evidence that these are actually on the outside and these are actually on the inside. And we can see that they correspond pretty well to the hydropathy index. But now what happens if we take too big of a window? So if we take a window of 13. Well, here we're losing the resolution. All these peaks are kind of merging together and we can't clearly distinguish the different features. So we need to choose a sliding window size that's going to be appropriate for our protein. And so you might have to play around with this a little bit, um, but also know that the hydropathy index isn't like an absolute, like, yes, this part's going to be inside. Yes, this part's going to be outside. Or yes, this is a transmembrane segment. And you might have to play around with the membrane, with the window size, and also like look to structures if available. Here's another example that we'll look at. This is another one of those soluble proteins, dogfish lactate dehydrogenase. Um, and so again, you can see with a small window, you're gonna get really noisy data. With a bigger window, you start to be able to make out more distinct um, features or the larger window, you're kind of able to make out individual features. But if you go too large, then you kind of lose things. So what if you were to look at membrane proteins? Well, here we're expecting to see larger hydrophobic spans and we're looking to see kind of bigger, um, we're looking to see high hydrophobic indexes in those spans often. And so here you can see that they're using a sliding window of nine. You can see there's a transmembrane domain here in erythrocyte glycophorin. Um, here's rabbit cytochrome B, and it has a membrane spanning segment, as well as this, um, so you, at this like, this carboxy terminal. So remember, this is your N terminus, this is your C terminus, and this is actually like a membrane anchor anchoring unit. So it, remember that not all the membrane proteins have those like are going all the way through a all, bunch of times and stuff. Sometimes you just have ones that are more associated with the membrane, um, such as held in there by a membrane span, um, by like a linker type of thing. And so this is representing one of those. And then here you have vesticular somatitis virus glycoprotein, and you can see that here's another membrane spanning segment. Now, just for comparison, here's what we we're looking at in the last slide, one of those water-soluble ones. They didn't do a window of seven for that, but they have one of five and one of nine. And you can see that this is going to be a lot, um, a lot noisier. It's not going to have, and when it has those peaks, they're not really as, they're not as high, they're not as pronounced um, and that sort of thing. Speaking of those transmembrane segments, sometimes often membrane proteins have multiple of them. So it's common for membrane proteins to have like seven. And often the part that's actually going through the membrane is going through as an alpha helix. And so it takes about 20 and 30 amino acids per pass and those are gonna be hydrophobic amino acids because they're gonna be hanging out in that lipidy environment. So if we want to look for a transmembrane segment, we're going to want to look for a continuous stretch of about 20 amino acids that are hydrophobic. And so in this plot, they only used a spanning window of seven, um, but normally if you're looking for those transmembrane segments, you're gonna be wanting to use a window of 19 to 21 amino acids. And we'll look and see, we'll look at, see how we can, um, what these plots will look like at different scales in a minute. Um, but you can make out that there's one, two, three, four, five, six and seven are harder to tell apart. Um, and this is actually because they're kind of, um, there's a smaller loop between them. And so it's harder to, it's harder to make them out. Um, but there are two transmembrane um, domains there. Before we look at some examples, just know that other hydropathy, um, hydrophobicity scales and things like this taken more into account, um, but then just the individual amino acid hydropathy indexes, they take into account the like, contribution, say, of what's attached to what, not just averaging them together, but taking into account things like the whole, the whole amino acid context, the whole residue thing. So now let's go check these out in a little more detail and how we can generate these scales as well as 
show you how these peaks represent how the different values on this hydrophobicity plot actually correspond to regions of the protein kind of nicely. So I have more posts on the PDB, but basically it's going to be a website that you can use to access the structures of all sorts of different molecules. So this can be x-ray structures, cryo-EM structures, all these various atomic models of proteins, um, protein nucleic acid complexes, all sorts of really cool stuff. And so this is 6-LDH. This is one of them that we are looking at in that Kite and Doolittle paper. And this is back when in the PDB, you actually had names actually kind of represented abbreviations for what the things actually stood for. So this is a lactate dehydrogenase, um, in this case from dogfish. If you go to the PDB, so this is the RCSB version, um, there are different ones in different countries. This is the, um, the protein data bank based out of the US at Rutgers. If you go and you look down, you scroll down, you can see that they actually show you this hydropathy plot. And so you can see this looks a lot like what we were just looking at before. And if we're looking at positive numbers, remember this is going to be hydrophobic because we're it's saying, okay, we're moving an amino acid from a region that is it um, likes a lipidy, greasy, membrane environment to one that it doesn't like, an aqueous, soluble one. That's what the hydropathy index represents. And so if it's positive, you're going to have mean something is hydrophobic. And then with the hydropathy plot, we're taking a sliding window where we average it over the course of a protein. And so if we look here, we can see that there seem to be some distinct regions that are going to be more hydrophobic. And we would predict that these were going to be on the inside of proteins, whereas these regions that are really hydrophilic, we'd expect to be on the outside of proteins. Is this true? We can go and we can look at the structure. So there are various ways to look at protein structures, but we're just going to be simple here. We're just going to use the integrated viewer on the PDB. So what we're looking at here is kind of like an assembly. There's actually multiple different subunits being shown. To make things simpler, instead of going to assembly, I'm just gonna to go to model. And then I'm gonna get rid of all these water molecules. So if we go here, we can see we can turn off the water molecules. Now I'm just gonna change the coloring so that we can see it from N to C terminus. So to do this, what I can do is I can just kind of go to this um, polymer, this cartoon, this cartoon, set coloring, and I want to color it by the, by the sequence ID. Okay, so now we can see that the end terminus, the start end is going to be dark blue, and the end end is going to be red. And now let's look and we'll go back and let's see what were some of the regions that it said were going to be hydrophobic. So one of these regions that showed as being hydrophobic was gonna be kind of in this like 20 or so amino acids. And what if we look at the structure? Where's that gonna be? Oh yeah, look, we're heading into this, this part right here that's really nicely hidden on the inside of a protein. Now let's look at another region. This part, we wouldn't expect this part to be hydrophobic. This would probably be hydrophilic. It's out on the surface. So we'll look, glycine 217. And if we cross-reference back to here, we can see that we're in that nice part where we have that nice, that nice hydrophilic, that negative density. And so you can check this out for yourself, how regions that are going to be high, have a high hydropathy index, a high positive hydropathy index are more likely to be found inside the protein. And those, those the high negative hydropathy index are likely to be found on the outside of the protein. And I encourage you to check this out. That was an example of one of those cytosolic proteins. But we also saw examples of membrane proteins, including bacteria over dopsin. So remember, that was the one where we had those seven membrane spanning segments. Again, here we're looking at basically we have an assembly, but if we, we can also look at individual in the individual subunits. But instead of just going from the hydropathy index that we see here, I want to actually show you how you can make your own hydropathy indexes for these proteins, change the sliding window and that sort of thing. And so let's do that. So I'm starting from the PDB here, but you can actually start from the from Uniprot as well. So Uniprot's kind of like where you can get more information about the actual proteins, whereas the PDB is going to be more information about the structure. However, they're both kind of linked to one another and to a bunch of other resources. So they're a good starting off point. 
And typically, if I'm interested in a protein, I'll start with Uniprot, and then you can actually find links to the PDB structures of it there. There's often multiple, if multiple groups have found structures of this protein. But in this case, I was starting at the PDB because I was going off of the, I wanted to look at the structure that was actually used in that Kite Doolittle paper to cross-reference between what they found and what the structural show, the structure showed. And so if we scroll down here, however, we can see that there's a link to Uniprot. So I can actually go and I can go directly to Uniprot from the structure and it'll show me the protein associated with it, the protein that was actually in that structure. Um, and it's because if you just kind of Google or search for bacteria rhodopsin, there's gonna be a lot of different species and stuff, but this is the one that was used in that paper. And now if I were to scroll down, what we can do is like, if I if you actually go to the sequence, now if you go to tools, you can go to prot scale. And prot scale is going to take you to XBASE prot scale, which is this cool tool that you can use to then be able to plot all sorts of different things. You can see that there's a lot of high, different, um, different scales that you can use. We're gonna look at this hydropathy, Kyle and Doolittle index, which is that main one that we've been talking about. So by default, it has it set to a window size of nine. It also, um, basically there's some different options that you can choose from. Like you can say, if you want to normalize it to, to um, if you want to normalize it to zero, from zero to one and that sort of thing. But we're just gonna keep it simple, go with the defaults. If we submit this, it's going to ask us to choose like whether we want to look at an individual segment of it. So it's showing you where these individual helices are. Um, we're just going to look at the whole thing, or at least most of the thing. Um, and so you can see here that we're able to make out these transmembrane domains in this hydropathy plot. But remember that this window is too small for what we would normally use for a transmembrane protein. If we're looking for transmembrane domains, we're going to want to use a bigger window. So if we were to go backwards, I kind of just had some tabs open so I don't have to keep pressing back but we can set a window size of say 21. If we submit this, we should expect to see a much less noisy plot. So here we have a window of nine, which is pretty noisy. Whereas if we choose a window of 21, well now here things are a little more distinct. We're able to make out those clear transmembrane domains as opposed to things that might just be, might just be noise. If you wanna see something really noisy, then you can go down to a window size of say three. And now if we do the same thing, we're gonna get something that's really, really noisy. So this was three, this was nine, and this was 21. So you can see that some of those little jaggedy stuff are kind of um, narrowing down. Another thing you can see from this plot is that we're kind of missing more of the, more of the different ends. And this is because what happens is that when you're going and at taking the average of these sliding windows, what you're going to do is you kind of take the, it's gonna be the center and then on either side. So we would have like 10 amino acids on either side of the one in the center. And so if you're in the beginning, you're not gonna have enough on the different sides to take that average in your moving average. And so you're gonna lose information about the start and the stop. And so we could also, if we wanted to, we can go and we can actually set this, um, do that normalization that it had given us that option for. So if you want to normalize it, this can be helpful if you're trying to compare different proteins, say. Um, and you can now have something that's going to be more normalized. Just That's just the scale of the scoring. It's not changing what's actually being graphed other than the scaling. And you can do this for any protein. And the nice thing about this tool too is, so if you go straight from Uniprot, it actually just, or you can type in the Uniprot ID, it's going to have the sequence imported for you. But you can also just enter whatever sequence you want. Um, and you can analyze different parts of a protein. There's a lot of different stuff you can do. And so I encourage you to play around. So remember the hydropathy index? in this case is looking at the individual amino acid level and telling you how hydrophobic it is, how would be positive or how hydrophilic it is. It would be a negative number. 
And the hydropathy plot is then taking a sliding window of that over the length of a protein and could be used to predict regions of a protein that are likely transmembrane regions or likely um, on the outside or inside of proteins. You can choose a window size that is going to be optimal for what you're trying to look at. So use a smaller window size if you're looking at a soluble protein and just want to see what's on the outside maybe, or a um, larger window like 19 to 21 to look for those transmembrane domains. But remember that this is just kind of like indirect evidence. And so if you really want evidence that something is a transmembrane domain or something is on the outside, then you're going to need to use other, um, other sorts of experiments, things like structural techniques to actually look at the structure of the protein, um, things like you can use enzyme assays to try to see if the if various residues are going to be able to be cut by a protease, say, if they're on the inside or outside of a protein or if they're on the surface. So there's various methods that you can use to kind of cross-validate. But by just looking at the sequence, you can often predict things about the protein.